a very warm welcome this evening anyway and thanks so much for um, spending your time with us for this evening's event the coastal and marine life of fleetwood and um, so i'm eve mulholland i'm the people engagement officer for a project called dynamic dunescapes and tonight we've got our special guest with us lucy and um, lucy if you just want to say hello Hello, I'm Lucy Mather. I'm one of the Marine Futures interns with Living Seas Northwest. Um, so I'll be taking you through the kind of marine side of some of the wildlife we get at Fleetwood and in the Irish Sea. Fantastic. Thanks, Lucy. So Dynamic Dunescapes, um, so Dynamic Dunescapes, it's a national project restoring some of the most important sand dune systems across England and Wales. And this isn't just for the benefit of wildlife, but it's for the people and the communities too. And Dynamic Dunescapes, it's, it's funded by um, National Lottery Heritage Fund and EU Life Programme. And we're work, working with multiple partnerships um, up and down the country. And the project is working across 34 sites. So this is in nine cluster areas around the whole of England and Wales. Um, and of 11 of those sites, the Cumbria team are actually covering them. So we're working from Silleth um, up at Greenpoint and Mowbray Banks, all the way up on the Solway Firth, all the way down Copeland, around Barrowborough, north of Walney, the south of Walney. But we're also covering Fleetwood too in Lancashire. And we're working closely the, with the wire council there and the project partners kind of leading on on this project in this area um, uh, Cumbria Wildlife Trust where my own role as the engagement officer um, is hosted Natural England um, who are leading on the conservation works we're also working with the National Trust too and we're working on the project on sand dunes because Sand dunes are a really important habitat and they're more important than ever really because they are now the habitat most at risk in Europe for biodiversity loss. And in Wales alone, I think since the 1900s, around about 60% of this habitat have been lost and there's only 20,000 hectares um, now remaining across England and Wales. And it's been identified as a priority habitat and this this is because it's home to an array of fascinating wildlife rare and protected species some of which we're going to be talking through tonight but dunes have become at risk and this is because they've become overgrown with vegetation and stabilized so the way in which we are managing sand dunes and how we go about conserving them has changed slightly and this is what dynamic dunescapes is all about implementing new conservation techniques to help conserve the fantastic array of biodiversity that lives there. Over to you, Lucy. Um, so Living Seas Northwest is a partnership between Cumbria, Lancashire and Cheshire Wildlife Trusts. Um, between them, they manage the English portion of um, the Irish Sea. So I'll explain more what I mean by the English portion later. But basically, we work across the Irish Sea with uh, local authorities and government, with volunteers and local communities um, and doing a whole range of different projects from kind of policy, research, um, advocacy work to protect all the different species that we find in the Irish Sea. Um, just a little sample of some of those species that you'll find um, to give you a bit of a taste for what I'll go through later. On the left here, we have the sea pen, which you find in the kind of deep muddy habitats off the coast of Cumbria and Lancashire. Um, and these are colonial species, so they're made up of lots of little different anemones that are all sort of working together as one animal. Um, and they sort of feed by filtering nutrients out of the water. And then at the other end of the scale, from kind of small habitats on the seabed, we have things like basking sharks, which are these huge, gentle giants that glide into our seas in the spring, feeding on zooplankton, which are these tiny little creatures that live in the water. Um, and, you know, they'll come through and they'll travel really long distances, finding, um, following, you know, where this nutrient rich water is. So the work that we do with Living Seas Northwest is very diverse to protect this, this vast diversity of species and habitats. Fantastic. So we're going to start our journey this evening on the sands of the Fleetwood coastline and we're going to venture out into the Irish Sea a bit later on with the help of Lucy. 
So here, as mentioned, we're working very closely with the wire council and Fleetwood dunes are this thin, narrow stretch of dune systems that stretches from Ferry Beach over the uh, northeastern end down the promenade around to Russell Point Tower. And the dunes here are almost restricted within the close vicinity of the road um, and, and the nearby housing. But they're, very, they're a very important habitat and the whole area is designated and protected as a triple SI, a special area of conservation and a special protected area too. And the dune sits right within that and they're part of this designation and this is due to the um, the habitat type that, that the dunes are part of and they're built up made up of mobile dunes and a strand line community. So Fleetwood dunes are almost very unique in this aspect as in that they're a dynamic environment, they're made up of lots of fair sand but they support a range of very specialist wildlife too. And some of these species are pioneer species. So these are species that are the first to colonize this type of habitat. And they are highly specialized to this open, bare, sandy, moving environment. So for instance, the sea holly, which is pictured in the middle. Now this is in absolute abundance on the Fleetwood coastline. And it's a lovely, lovely plant. And it's especially adapted to this environment as it has really thick um, waxy leaves um, to hold that moisture in, but really long roots as well to anchor itself into this sandy moving environment. And we've got the sea bind weed on the left hand side as well. And this is, this is also known as morning glory. Um, it's insect pollinated um, plant as well as the um, sea holly um, but it's very low low lying so it grows right right on top of the sand and it stretches out quite long but this also has thick waxy stems to withhold that moisture and on the right hand side is sea spurge as well and this is a this is um this is kind of restricted to this sandy habitat so you don't really find it elsewhere but you'll find it along the coastline in these mobile dune systems but because there's a whole host of open sandy environment that are home to a range of specialist wildflowers, this means there's a whole host of insects too. And around about 120 insects have been recorded on the Fleetwood coastline in this area. I wouldn't really be surprised if there's more. And one of these just pictured on the um, left hand side there is the June chafer beetle. And this dune chafer beetle is restricted to sandy dune um, habitats in the northern kind of coastline area. But this species, it has seen a decline um, recently and it's, it's very, um, it's prone to disturbance. And it's a very sensitive species because what it does, it will burrow within the sand, directly in the sand to hibernate. But it'll also lay its eggs just directly on top of the sand surface too, and it only lays one brood a year. So any, any disturbance can kind of be detrimental, I suppose, to um, that year's offspring. But most notably on the um, Fleetwood coastline is also an abundance of bees and many species of Andrina, um, which is the genus for mining bees, um, have been recorded here. And mining bees, they get their name because they're the solitary bees, but they'll burrow within, within the ground, so dig themselves their own tunnel to live. And I, Andrina is one of the largest um, genus of bees and um, recorded on the Fleetwood, you might find the early mining bee or the Wilkes mining bee, for instance. And these are highly specialised again to their dune environment because they require sandy substrate for digging the tunnels and um, to nest in the ground to lay their eggs. But they're also quite sensitive to the temperatures as well. So they'll hide themselves within the ground in their tunnels and um, to protect themselves from frost and heat. So they're able to go out and you know collect food and whatnot when, when the temperature is right and they've gained enough energy. But pictures on this um, on the right hand side there, this large image of a bee. Now this is called the um, coastal leaf cutter bee. And leaf cutter bees, um, they're in a family called, I'm not very good at saying this, but, but the Megaculidae family of about 225 species. And most leaf cutter bees are solitary, the same as mining bees, but these coastal leaf cutter bees in particular, they tend to be found in like small aggregations. And the cold, the cold leaf cutter bees, because what they'll do is they'll um, they'll go to a near, nearby plant or a leaf, and they'll actually cut themselves a small section out of that leaf, and they'll take that back to the nest, and they'll actually form themselves um, a cell, um, which in, in which they'll lay their eggs within their tunnels.
And this is this species can also be found at Fleetwood dunes. And again, this is restricted to these coastal sandy open habitat types as it feeds in particularly on um, sea holly, which is one of the um, plants I mentioned before. But it's not just it's not just bees, it's not just beetles, there's a whole other range of insects too. And I'd be here all night if I was talking about them all. But these other species may include butterflies, such as the holly blue, the gatekeeper, or the small blue. There's also the um like the, the common the common white butterfly as well, the cabbage white. You'll find this feeding on um sea, sea kale, which is a big cabbage leaf plant that you'll find along the coast too. And a range of moth species, which is the silver Y pictured down there on the bottom the left hand side. But because there's uh, so many insects, so many different wildflowers, of course, there's a whole host of bird species to it. We'll probably, it's just that time of year now where we're starting to get out and about on our daily local walls and we're he hearing the songs of these birds locally. And it's a lovely place to go and walk down the promenade on Fleetwood to hear the different sounds of the birds. And one that we're probably most familiar with is the Skylark, which is just pictured on the bottom left hand side there. This has a beautiful song. It's just it's a small brown bird, but this species is actually a red listed species and it's very much in decline. I think since the, in the 1990s alone, um, the number of the population of this species halved. Now, skylarks, they require a very specific habitat for nesting, so they need longer, longer grasses to nest. So the decline is actually related to um, agriculture and changes in agricultural practices. So this includes like a switch from spring to autumn sown cereals, um, lots of farming stubbles, which are areas where you get lots of insects where they'll feed, but also a switch from use of hay to silage as well. So it means there's long grassy areas that you'd normally find in land um, are in decline because of the changes in these practices. So this is why we, we often find them on our side and dunes locally. And pictured on the top left there is a lovely handsome looking stone chat and they get their names from um, a loud sharp call. But we also find wheat ears, linnets, which are also another red listed species. These have like almost a red, red colour under the wing, which you can identify them on. And meadow pipits can be found in and around the long vegetation of the dune system down the Fleetwood coastline. But overhead, kite flying by, passing through, obviously we have all sorts of gull colonies as well, black-headed gulls, herring gulls, common gulls. But you might be lucky enough as well to see um, passing migrant birds too. And these might include um, the little tern or the arctic tern as well, if, if you're lucky. And the Arctic Tern, this is a summer visitor, which you may be looking to spot on passage probably around May to May to June time. And they migrate all the way from Antarctica, so they come a very long way to breed over kind of Northum Northumbria area, Northumberland area, sorry. And I'm sure, and there's a bird observatory at um, Russell Point Tower, which I'm sure have absolutely bags of information about these different species. But out across the out across the sands, um, we also have kind of a, a muddy area as well, a kind of um, an intertidal mud area, and this is full of life in itself, full of microbial activity, lookworms, insects, crustaceans, and all of that. So this means it's a great feeding ground as well. Looking out over over from the dunes out towards the sea, you'll find a whole host of raiders where they they'll find find their foods within this intertidal mud area. And one of these includes the oyster cat which is it's pictures in the uh, image there but you might also find your ring plovers your purple sandpipers and turnstones too and turnstones and um, purple sandpipers are they're a short stocky stocky wader they're dark gray with a white bellied and they're a winter visitor and they eat winkles insects spiders and, and also plants and um, but you'll often spot this bird around kind of the piers and hiding in and out of the groins uh, where they might find a few more wheat winkles and things that they'll be able to eat But looking out from the dunes out across the sands and into the seas, there's a whole other range of wildlife as well. And Lucy's, Lucy's going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. But you might be lucky enough to spot gannets diving down into the water, Manx shear waters, which is an amber listed species. And these, these breed offshore on like islands around the UK and um, they migrate from South America um, for winter. Or even Arctic skewers, and these are a red listed species again, um, but a summer visitor 
visitor um, to the Yorkneys. So you'll see these on passage from Fleetwood when you're on your walk, um, if you're lucky, um, probably passing by around August or September time, so a little bit later. In the Arctic skewer, they can actually be a bit of an aggressive birds towards other species as well, particularly terns, and they'll often snatch, their, snatch the prey from other species, so a little bit cheeky there. Um, I'm just going to try and um, play some bird calls for you. Hopefully you'll be able to hear them. And I just wonder if you'll be able to um, recognise um, any of the bird sounds. Got that first one right sorry that was a little bit loud i um, hope that didn't alarm you all um too much first one was a skylark and the second one that was a manx shear water and then obviously gulls in the background there but going back to the wildlife on our coastline on the dunes kind of further north and further south of the dunes at fleetwood there's a whole range of other wildlife there as well and just down the coast on the files coast actually they've just introduced them um, successfully sand lizards to the area again this is a highly specialist species that the sand dunes and these open sandy habitats and further north up the coastline on the drig dunes or even further south on the sefton coast you might find the northern dune tiger beetle so this is only found in those two locations and again highly specialized it likes south facing dunes and um, it burrows within these like sand, sandy hills and lays its eggs deep down there and the and the um, the larva will develop in these tunnels and they'll wait for its prey to kind of pass through and they'll, they'll capture this prey but they're actually one of the fastest beetles in the in the world and um, once they're fully grown and finally not to mention the natterjack toad which is probably the most notable species that we find on our sand dunes and this is a it's a rare and protected species and again highly adapted to these sand dune environments it will burrow to hibernate um, and it requires um, very specific dune slacks um, and pools which need to be warm for them to breed in so i'm going to pass over to lucy now who's going to continue the journey for us thank you very much you that was fascinating to hear about i'm not as as hot on dune wildlife as you so that was lovely to listen to um i'm going to take you through a few of the habitats and species that we find within the irish sea um so in marine environments you have a vast diversity of different habitats and some of these are really kind of localized ecological niches with um, species that mostly stay entirely in that system. For example, anemones or barnacles, which are kind of physically rooted to the rock itself. So will stay, you know, where they live um, to really far ranging species like sharks and jellyfish and seals, which can travel several kilometers. Gray seals are known to travel up to sort of 40 or 50 kilometers um, foraging for food and, and hunting. So um, the habitats I'm going to take you through are just shown on the pictures here. I'm not sure if you can read the writing, um, but I'll take you through muddy sediment, um, rocky reefs, kelp beds, sand and gravel, um, biogenic reefs, which I'll explain what they are later, um, seagrass meadows, deep water corals, and of course, open sea. And these are all habitats that we have within the Irish Sea, which I think is sometimes surprising. Coral and sponges and things like that are often thought of as quite um, exotic species, but we do actually have coral species here ourselves. So I'll start off with muddy sediment. Um, this is the kind of habitat that you get a lot in the Irish Sea. We've got vast areas of kind of intertidal mud and that continues down into the deeper sea. Um, and this mud's really rich in nutrients. So you get a lot of species here, which are filter feeders or kind of detritus feeders. So these anemones and the sea pens, they feed by catching nutrients out of the water um, or other kind of small creatures out of the water, bring them in, digesting them. Um, we also have the Dublin Bay prawns, which is langoustine or scampi, as you might have heard of it. Um, 
And the Irish Sea is really, really rich in them. They're a really important species. Um, and they live in the subtidal mud. They bury down into the mud and they again feed on kind of little detritus things that they find in the water. Um, rocky reefs, which you could consider as the kind of rock pools that you get in the intertidal zone between the high tide and the low tide, and also where the rock continues down into the, the subtidal region, into the you know underwater region. Um, and these are really important for a few different reasons. They create a hard substrate which species can latch onto. So something like an anemone needs a solid surface to attach itself to so that it can be anchored and it can filter feed from the more turbulent water. Um, small species like fish and little rays, um, they'll use the rocks for their shelter. So there's lots of little niches and crevices where a little fish can hide away and therefore be a bit more protected from predators. Um, and of course the rocks then have other things growing onto them so seaweed can create another habitat for again small fish to kind of shelter in um, and for things like otters and seals to sort of come in to look for food. Um, we also have a lot of different starfish in the Irish Sea. I think starfish are often considered a bit more of an exotic species um, but we have seven different species of starfish in the Irish Sea, including the bloody hemorrhage starfish shown here, um, which is actually the common name for two different scientific species that are just sort of too difficult to identify consistently. So we have the same common name for them. Um, as I mentioned, the seabed, not, not the seabed, sorry, the seaweed, um, when it's in the water, is a whole habitat in itself. So kelp forests um, and species of kelp like orweed or sugar kelp um, have creatures that live on them and feed on the kelp itself. So for example, the blue rayed limpet shown on the left here is this gorgeous little sea snail with these beautiful like fluorescent stripes down its back. And you can tell when they've been on a frond of kelp because they'll have eaten away a little tiny hole in the kelp and you can just see the mark they've left. At the anchor point of the kelp, so where the kelp attaches to the seabed, you get these tiny sheltered microhabitats and all kinds of species grow there. So the photo here on the right is of a stalked jellyfish, um, which you'll find in these kind of sheltered anchor points at the bottom of the kelp. Um, but you'll also get all kinds of other species like sea mats, which is another colonial species. So lots of little different organisms working together as kind of one codependent animal. Um, kelp forests and seaweed forests generally are also really important for both um, small fish because they'll shelter there and, and use it as a kind of nursery ground and for predators who come looking for that fish and for the other creatures that live there. So they really are hubs of kind of biodiversity and productivity and you'll get loads of creatures there. By comparison, the sand and gravel can sometimes look a bit benign and lifeless. You know, it's just like the beach we have on the shore, but we've gone underwater. Um, but again, they're real hubs of life um, and especially creatures like rays and small sharks and cuttlefish I'll use these as really important hunting grounds. Um, these species can quite often detect sort of electromagnetic fields. So they can detect the electrical signals that small organisms give off just from their, their kind of nerve interactions. Um, and sharks and rays can detect these and therefore find them buried in the mud and dig down and eat them. So it's a really important hunting ground and obviously an important hiding ground for those species that are buried in the mud. It's also the habitat of the oldest lived organism that we know of in the world, which is the ocean quahog. Um, and these again may seem quite benign, they're sort of a, a fairly big filter feeding um, bivalve, so you know a hinged shell with two parts, um, and they'll sit um, on the sand and, and feed from nutrients in the water. 
Um, but as I said, they're really, really old. And the oldest specimen of these that's been found is, is over 500 years. So we actually have um, a colony of them in the Irish Sea and they're a really important protected species. And one we like to shout about because they're very cool. Um, we also have loads of kind of crustacean species that will live in this sand and gravel and scuttle about feeding on lots of lots of little creatures that are in the sand um, and I'm sure all of you will have seen things like hermit crabs at the beach and in the subtidal zone again we get hermit crabs but they're much bigger they take those beautiful big whelk shells we sometimes find make their home in them. Biogenic reefs are a really interesting one. So um, we define a biogenic reef as any hard sub substrate which is created by a living organism. So this is things like mussel beds and worm reefs. So I'll start by explaining what honeycomb worms are because I think they're probably the lesser known of these two. Um, so honeycomb worms are these little filter feeding worms that build these beautiful reefs um, basically by creating a kind of hard tunnel around themselves um, in order to protect themselves and they'll live within one of these little pods and filter feed from there. So one of these reefs is sort of a whole colony of, of thousands of these worms living together. And because it creates another hard substrate that other creatures can kind of attach onto or um, yeah, use the shelter of, it again creates a real hub for biodiversity. So a healthy sort of functioning honeycomb worm reef will typically have around 30 to 40 other species also living in that same structure using the shelter and the protection that it gives. The same kind of thing happens with um, blue mussel reefs, which you'll almost definitely have seen on like piers or, or the rocks at the beach when um, in the region between the tides. Um, they're one of the first species to kind of colonise a new exposed surface. And they're a really important species for loads of different animals, whether it's um, gulls and ducks who feed on them, or again, little creatures that will use the shelter of them, barnacles and seaweed that will kind of attach onto them as a, a hard structure um, and all kinds of other species. And then I've put native oysters in here just because they're quite a hot topic in the UK at the moment. We don't have any in the Irish Sea. They're locally extinct. However, there's all kinds of really exciting restoration projects going on around the south and west coasts, sorry, south and east coasts um, of the UK to bring back these native oyster beds um, and bring back all the, all the biodiversity that comes with them. You might still find native oyster shells on the beaches here because we did used to have really thriving native oyster colonies in the Irish Sea. So if you do find a native oyster shell, there's a chance that that's, you know, a couple of hundred years old. So that's exciting. Um, another bit of a hot topic in sort of marine habitats at the moment is um, seagrass. And that's because it's a really great um, habitat for carbon capture. So they reckon that seagrass meadows are 35 times more efficient than tropical rainforest at capturing carbon, locking it away um, and yeah, keeping it in the sea, producing oxygen. Though they cover only 0.1% of the global seabed, it's thought that they're responsible for around 11% of the sort of stored carbon in the ocean. So that's like a really significant um, intake of carbon and definitely a habitat worth protecting. And then beyond the climate side of it, they're really important for fish stocks. So around a third of the world's, world's global fisheries benefit from um, fish who have spawned and sort of lived out their juvenile stages in seagrass meadows. And they're also really important for species like crabs and geese who wade in the seagrass and eat the seeds and, and the leaves. And then I said we had coral, very exciting topic for the Irish Sea. Um, we have what are thought of as deep water or cold water corals. So these are corals rather than the tropical kind which grow in warm waters. These grow between around four and 12 degrees C. Um, 
And because they don't have that um, symbiotic relationship with algae, which the shallow water tropical corals have, because they don't have this algae creating energy for them, um, they're much slower to grow and therefore slower to recover when they're damaged, unfortunately. Um, a few of the species we have are shown here. So on the left, we've got dead man's fingers, which are a type of soft coral that we get in a lot of habitats in the Irish Sea. And then the pink sea fan is sort of a closer relation of your traditional tropical hard or horny coral. Um, and they're, yeah, they're found in sort of your muddy sediment habitats in the Irish Sea. And then we've also got a great diversity of sponges, which is something I didn't know until starting this role. So it's always exciting to learn. Um, and this one shown on the right here is called an elephant's hide sponge, which I'm sure you can all kind of guess why. Um, but if any of you have a moment and want to learn more about the sponges, I'd highly recommend looking at the, the species A to Z on the Living Seas Northwest website because we have loads of different sponge species in the Irish Sea and they're absolutely beautiful to have a look at. And then finally, it's it's a whole ocean. So we've got loads of what we call pelagic species, which means the species that are in the open sea. Um, and these vary enormously from things like jellyfish, drift with the currents, some swim a little bit, but they're much more kind of benign, beautiful, ethereal creatures. Um, and they bring with them leatherback turtles, which can sometimes be found in the Irish Sea, um, sunfish, and all kinds of other um, predator species which will come and feed on jellyfish when other prey sources are more scarce. Um, we've also got a vast diversity of marine mammals so we have eight different species of whales and dolphin in the Irish Sea, we have bottlenose dolphin, common dolphin, I believe we have white beaked dolphin, um, if you go over to the Isle of Man where there's sort of deeper waters you've got Rizzo's dolphin which are this beautiful really pale dolphin with kind of a, a humped head um, and they hang out on kind of the continental shelf at the the change between the shallower and the deeper water um, and then we have species like the orca shown here um, humpback whales minke whales all kinds of other beautiful marine mammals as well as as well as of course our seals um, and then we have a few different species of sharks and kind of large cartilaginous fish. So that's the fish that have skeletons made of cartilage rather than um, bone. Um, so this photo here, I believe is a blue shark, although it might be a thresher shark. I can't quite see its tail, um, but we have a whole range of different shark species. And again, I'd highly recommend checking out the, the species explorer on the website if you want to know more of them. Eve, I believe it's over to you. <laughs> Blimey, thanks so much, Lisa. That was fascinating. I mean, I, I certainly didn't know about quahog, so that's re really interesting to learn about. Thank you. I'm very glad. So, so going back to the shoreline then, so back back to the dunes um, of Fleetwood. Um, as we mentioned earlier, they are the habitat most at risk in Europe for biodiversity loss. And this is largely due to stabilisation. So to understand this a little bit further, I'm just going to take you quickly through the, um, the processes of how dunes form. So dunes, um, like, like on Fleetwood, made up of mobile dunes, they begin their life just as grains of sand that get blown about and they'll get trapped by an obstacle. So this might be one of the pioneer species, which I talked about earlier, or just something lying, lying on the ground. And the sand will start to build and grow around this species or, or the object. And as the sand grows, more, more, more and more pioneer species will start to colonise this. So more sand builds, more pioneer species colonise. And as these pioneer species start to grow and die down, more nutrients are started to input into the ground. So this means a, a range of other species can start to grow in these places too. So this might be mosses, it might be lichens, it might be other different types of wildflowers, it might be mushrooms, it, it might even be dune heath, which is another habitat that's at risk. But you tend to find as you go further into a dune system that you'll get less bare sand in these areas. 
And within your dune system, you'll have dune slacks. So what happens is the wind will erode through the dune system, blowing away, blowing a gully in a channel through, through the dune hills there. And the dunes become a little bit closer to the ground water. So they'll become closer to the ground, um, so it'll be a damper environment. And this means pools will start to form. And these pools are often ephemeral, so they'll, they'll come and go. But these habitats, these dune slacks, these are really important places for other species too, like the natterjacks, which we mentioned earlier. Um, important assemblages of invertebrates, such as the black-tailed skimmer, which you can see there. But also a whole host of other plant species, such as rare orchids and we have the dune helleborine up here in Cumbria which is a nationally scarce species and um, which grows in these kind of sand, sandy but damper habitats. And the later suck stages, stages of succession, you'll find scrubland. So as more nutrients are input into the ground, you naturally find some scrubs start to grow like gorse for instance. However, Nowadays, the, this, this later succession of dune, dune kind of growth has accelerated. And th this is because of a number of reasons. So since, since about the 1940s, um, this is, we've seen this start to happen. And you can see on the map there, there's two maps. This, this shows Sandscale Halls, which is, um, which is a nature reserve just in the, in the Cumbria area there. And the red patches show areas of bare patches of sand. So as you can see in 1946, there was a lot of bare sand on this sand dune system. System. But as you can see in about 2018 to more recent days, this bare sand has been pushed to the very, very edges of the dune systems. And this is this is a problem because many of the specialist species which we talked about earlier in the talk, they rely on these open sandy habitats to thrive. However, we found this these later successional stages overtaken for a number of reasons. This is partly due to loss of rabbit populations, which would naturally kind of graze dune systems and burrow creating open bare patterns patches of sand, increasing atmospheric nitrogen deposition, accelerating vegetation growth, as well as climate change and change in land use. Now, historically, we've used the land, um, we've tried to keep people off the dunes, we've actually used the dunes to stabilise them as well. But these have all led to the kind of the growth and the loss of these sandy habitats where we see kind of a typical dune system today, which kind of looks like this. So an awful lot of coarse grasses and a lot of um, a lot of scrub in there as well. But at Fleetwood Dune, this is slightly different. So Fleetwood, it's lucky enough to be made up of a lot of this open sandy habitat, which, as we know, is important for so many different species. But there's one species in particular that is a little bit of a problem. And now this, this, this lovely looking flower, as lovely as it may seem, it's it's an invasive species and it's not native. And this is Rosa rugosa, um, commonly known as the Japanese rose. And this grows all along the Fleetwood dunes now. And you can see by this map, um, it grows all the way from kind of Ferry Beach all the way down that you can find in some um, some big clusters. But Rosa rugosa is a bit of a problem on Fleetwood dunes because it's an invasive species, so it grows very, very rapidly. So it can very easily outcompete um, natural those natural native species and those wildflowers, which are at home and important to many important insects and other wildlife that we've talked about. So dynamic dunescapes as part of the project and um, working nationally, we are working to tackle some of these invasive species problems, and we're looking to to imply some of this at Fleetwood Dunes too. And we'll be looking to remove some areas of this Rosa rugosa to help these important species thrive. And there's a range of different ways which we do this. This might be by machine removal, this might be by removal by hand, or it might be by spot spraying. But this is this is this is not a preferred way because obviously spraying with herbicide can have other impacts on species too. So there's going to be work being taken place on Fleetwood dunes and we're going to be working very closely with the landowners here as well to make sure um, that what we are doing benefits, benefits the system but it keeps people and the public safe as well. Obviously it's in a very public area so we don't want to be having any large fire trying to remove this species so we're going to manage that quite effectively there. But there's a whole range of kind of other conservation works that are going to be happening to protect sand dune species up and down Cumbria, but across England and Wales too.
So one of the methods that we're doing is to help protect these dune slacks, dune slack areas. And this is one of those habitat types where vegetation has come in and overgrown. And this is a particular problem for natterjack toads, for instance, because they require very specific breeding conditions to be able to go into the pools and um, to, to lay their eggs. And they find it very difficult to move across kind of coarse vegetation and large scrub, which can come in to come in to disrupt these pools. So what we're doing in some places up and down Cumbria is um, clearing a little bit of the scrub around the around the um, dune slacks to make it more open and also creating new pools as well for the natterjack toes to breed. We're also creating scrapes or open patches of bare sand and um, where this vegetation growth has come in and um, to allow space for these special species to burrow, to lay their eggs um, and for wildflower species to flourish. And finally, one other conservation technique is the introduction of cattle grazing. And now cattle have been used historically on the dunes for grazing. And actually it was rabbits. Rabbits were used on, on rabbit warrens and farmed. Um, and there's evidence of this going back hundreds and hundreds of years. And what we're doing in some places on some of the larger dune systems is introducing native stock breeds um, to help um, help the rotivation and um, to help keep that scrub at bay. And they actually disturb the ground. And you might think, well, you know, does this not have an impact on other species such as natterjack toads and insects? Well, actually, by that little bit of disturbance, it does help um, to open up the bare patches of sand and kickstart that early successional stages. So we get a diverse range and a mosaic of habitat types for all of these specialist species to thrive. So I'm going to hand over to Lucy now who's going to talk about some of the uh, fantastic things they're doing to protect out in the Irish Sea. Wonderful, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Living Seas Northwest works in the English part of the Irish Sea which is what's highlighted in blue here. And then we work in a network with the Scottish, the Irish, um, the Northern Irish, and the Welsh um, Wildlife Trusts and the Isle of Man Wildlife Trust. Um, and between all of those organisations, we sort of work together to protect all the different habitats across the whole Irish Sea. So there's a lot of different ways um, to protect marine habitats, um, and it sort of depends on which legislation you're using. So this map here just shows a few of the different conservation zones or marine protected areas in the Irish Sea and I'll just briefly explain what the different ones are. So highlighted in purple we have special areas of conservation. So these are protected under the EU Habitats Directive and they will either be protecting a specific species or group of species or specific features such as subtidal mud or reefs or coral mounds or other sort of key sensitive habitats. Um, you can see sort of very faintly along the um, near the shore is a sort of dashed pink zone. Um, these are special protection areas. So the one here is Liverpool Bay um, and these are protected for birds and it's under the EU Birds Directive. It's usually for either threatened species or species which are present on their migration in kind of significant numbers. And then in pink, you have the Marine Conservation Zones or MCZs. And this is kind of the UK equivalent of those special areas of conservation. So they're smaller areas usually, and they're designated to protect specific um, species or habitats. In the area around Fleetwood, we have quite a few different ones. So as I mentioned, Liverpool Bay is a large um, special protection area for seabirds. Um, west of Walney is a marine conservation zone protecting um, subtidal sediment and mud and that's for species like the sea pen which I discussed earlier. Um, Morecambe Bay special area of conservation is protecting a range of different habitats including the sea inlets, the intertidal mud, dunes, shingle and sea cliffs all of which are really important for loads of different species and especially for birds. I think in Morecambe Bay alone, around 200,000 different wading birds come and spend the winter there every year. So it's a really, really important habitat. We've got the Wire and Loon MCZ, which is a fairly recently designated marine conservation zone. And that's to protect the nursery grounds for smelt, 
which are um, uh, really beautiful and I think threatened, I might be wrong on that, um, species of fish, which are also quite commercially important for fish stocks. So this is designated to kind of protect the, the wider populations of that species. Um, you have the shell flat and loon deep special area of conservation, which is a big sandbank, which is used again um, by birds that are foraging for food. And the filed MCZ, which is quite a large area of subtidal sediment. So this is sand and mud, and it's designated because it protects a sort of representative sample of the wildlife of the Irish Sea. So you'll find all kinds of things there, like different invertebrates. You've got loads of different bivalves, mollusks, shellfish. Um, you've got lots of types of fish there. Um, and it's just a really wonderful and really diverse marine conservation zone. In terms of what we do to protect the seas, um, there's a whole range of different activities from campaigning and local policy, um, engagement, research and monitoring, and all kinds of work to help with kind of sustainable fisheries and ocean education. Um, so the first thing we do is we sit on the Northwest IFCA, which is the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. Um, and they work with local fisheries in the inshore zone, which I think is up to six kilometers out to sea, it might be 12 kilometers. Um, and that's working to help ensure that fishing is done sustainably and that the kind of fish stocks are protected as well as the impact on other wider wildlife is protected. So the fisheries in the Irish Sea are really important for shellfish, especially. So things like mussels, cockles, um, other shellfish, <laughs> and also for things like whelk, which are um, like large sea snails that are um, farmed and exported, well not farmed, harvested um, and exported. And the IFCA makes sure that this fishing is done sustainably and that the stocks are protected and when um, it is looking like there's going to be negative impacts on a population, then the IFCA can pass bylaws to, to help regulate that. Um, as part of our sustainable fisheries work, we also have a research project based in Cumbria, which is looking at um, the use of creel fishing, so sort of static pot fishing within marine conservation zones, um, to help sort of promote more sustainable fisheries. Potting has a lot less damage on the seabed because you're not dragging anything along, you're just putting pots down and picking them up again. Um, and also because you can catch the fish live or not the fish, this is for um, langoustines, so crustaceans. Um, but because you can catch the fish live, then you can ensure that um, you put any smaller ones back and that if any, uh, females with the eggs on them, then you put them back as well. Um, so this is a much better system for maintaining the stocks and making sure you have kind of healthy ecosystems, but also you get much larger um, catch. And because the catch is live, you can sell it for a much better price than if you sort of accidentally killed it by trawling. We also run a project called My Local Catch, which is working with local communities along Cumbria um, to understand what's caught in their Irish Sea, how they can cook it, how it relates to, you know, all the species that they've sort of seen on Blue Planet and other shows like that. Um, and the idea of this is to really promote um, the things that are caught locally being sold and eaten locally and just improve the sustainability of the whole system and help communities really feel ownership of their, um, their local seas. Um, in terms of research and monitoring, we have a lot of different projects. My personal favorite, because it's very cute, is um, the seal monitoring. So at South Walney, just in the north of Morecambe Bay, we have a colony of gray seals. Um, there's around 500 there. On a recent count, we had 518 seals present. Um, it's a really important colony. The seals are there because quite a lot of them forage sort of in the wind farms around um, west of Warnley area. Um, 
and it's also a breeding colony. So this year we've had five pups and I think it's for about the last five or six years we've had pups there. And a really important part of our work is kind of monitoring that, making sure those pups um, are still being born each year and that they all seem to be kind of healthy and fledging OK. Some other work we do is sort of researching um, important sensitive habitats and how we can protect them. So we have research work into these honeycomb worm reefs, which is what this photo shows, um, and also seagrass meadows. And this is things like mapping the extent of them, looking at ways that we can do sort of restoration and protection projects, and just generally raising the profile of these wonderful habitats. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Morecambe Bay is incredibly important for wading birds, especially there's loads of different species that spend the winter here. Um, and because overwintering birds especially are sort of storing up fat for their long migration again, a, lo a lot of them exist really at the edge of the energy that they're able to use. So one of the things that we do is working with local wardens and um, coastal nature reserves to help monitor bird disturbance and help kind of encourage people to not disturb the birds by, you know, things like dog walking. Um, because just the difference between flying away from people being too close and not flying away can be the difference that that's really important, whether or not they can store up enough energy. Um, I'm just looking at the question saying, which bird is this? I believe it's a sandaling, um, but I'm not amazing at wading bird ID. Um, but sandalings are very cute. They're these tiny little sort of, um, yeah, like thrush size species. No, smaller, maybe they're about a fist sized. And you'll see them along the shore of the beach. Um, as the tide goes away, they'll all run forwards and pick at little um, shrimps and invertebrates that are sort of exposed by the tide. And then as the tide comes back, they'll run away again. So um, they're a very sweet one to see. And we definitely have them along this coast. So keep an eye out for them. <laughs> Smashing, thanks Lucy. It's so good to see the seals doing so well as, <laughs> as well. Um, so Dynamic Genescapes is, is part of the kind of project. We are also running like a long-term monitoring scheme as well. And this is this is a pioneering mon monitoring scheme to monitor how how the what the impacts the interventions that we're doing as part of the project are having to help inform for future management and to ensure we, we know what we're doing on the dunes is sustainable. Um, so as part of the project, we'll be setting up this scheme all along the country at different sites and um, at the moment it's set up on three sites in Cumbria and we'll be looking at expanding that um, as the project develops over the next couple of years but it's not only about um, the conservation as well it's about the people too so we're also wanting to get people involved in the project when safe to do so and um, so things like running litter picks caring for the beach getting involved in practical conservation and um, getting schools involved and things like that too is all a really important part of the project so as soon as it's safe to do so we're, we're wanting to get up and running with that and get as many people in, in, involved as we can and as part of this as well as getting the community involved, so wider members of the community, running events, running art programmes, um, having some fun on the dunes so people get the chance to learn about the fascinating, wonderful species that we have on there, um, but having a good time as well. And we're also wanting to provide opportunity for our next generation of conservationists. Um, so we've got opportunities up at the moment um, for people to apply to a small bursary scheme to help us um, understand the management of sand dunes, to understand some of the most important species on our dunes as well. So, so it helps site managers directly working with other environmental bodies and um, to understand how to care for these um, going forwards in future. And you can find a bit more about uh, these student research projects and the proposals, what you can get involved in on, on our website. And we have all kinds of different um, community engagement projects going on with Living Seas Northwest as well. Um, in non-COVID times, we would be out on the beach every week doing things like nature tots, which is kind of a kid's activity, doing stuff like rock pooling. Um, also doing shore search, which is our citizen science project um, and all kinds of other practical activities um, because of the lockdown. They're not on at the moment, um, but we have lots of online events, digital things going on. So if you check out our website and our social media, then there's always things going on. 
Um, and we also have sort of self-guided activities like the tail trails, which again, you can find on the website. And there's actually one based along the wire if you'd like a local one to explore. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of things you can get involved with. I'm just checking my notes to see if there's anything else I was meant to tell you about. Oh yeah, sorry. We also work with lots of um, partnership projects like the Morgan Bay Partnership, uh, which is with lots of different organisations working across the whole Morgan Bay landscape. Um, and again, if you check them out, they have lots of projects you can get involved in. Um, and finally, we have the Marine Futures Internship, which is what I'm doing now and we're recruiting for it very soon. So if there's any budding conservationists out there, then keep an eye out for this in sort of early mid-March. Um, this is a partnership project with the offshore wind industry. So it's with the Crown Estate who managed the seabed and Ørsted who are an offshore wind developer as well as Natural England. And we work across a whole range of projects looking at how marine wildlife interacts with um, offshore wind developments and how they can sort of be designed to allow for net gain. So leaving the marine environment a better place for wildlife than before. Smashing, thanks Lisey. So to find out more, we've got a range of contact details here. So you can visit our Dynamic Genescapes website or to find out how to get involved with the project or to volunteer, you can visit the Cumbria Wildlife Trust website too. Um, and finally, to mention Love My Beach are already active in the area. They've been looking after the coastline there for a number of years and a fantastic group of volunteers who look after the beach doing litter picks and beach cleans. Unfortunately, it's not active at the moment due to COVID, but they're hoping to get up and running soon. Um, but they have a launching a fantastic new um, initiative to help tackle coastal pollution in the area and um, asking people to see it, report it and prevent it. And you can visit their website lovemybeach.org to find um, an information leaflet which will tell you what to look out for and how to report it. And Lucy's got a list, list of their details there, you can just quickly run through that Lucy. Yeah, so the Living Seas Northwest website has all the, the sort of resources and information about um, if you're curious of any of the projects or any of the different species I've talked about, then there's loads of information on there. Um, some of the links on there are down at the moment. So for things like if you have any interesting wildlife sightings you'd like to let us know about, or if you see any sort of stranded animals that need rescue, then you can email livingseasnorthwest at cumbriawildlifetrust.org.uk. Um, and then we should be able to kind of help or, or report it to the relevant authorities. Um, you can also get in touch on our social media and I've put the partner project there, Filed Sand Dunes. I know someone in the chat asked about St Anne's and the reason that's not part of Dynamic Dunescapes is because there's kind of different conservation things that are needed for different areas. Um, and in St Anne's, it's actually more about trying to stabilise the dunes and um, Sand Dunes have all kinds of projects um, going on to get involved with that. So you can check out their social media too um, for some of their activities. Um, and then finally, coming up in this year, we've got some new interpretation going along the, the wire and the Fleetwood Coast, um, which is sort of linked to the wire tail trail, which is already on the website. So if you keep an eye out for that, there'll be some sort of interesting new artwork and interpretation boards going up, which are usually fun to look at. <laughs> Smashing. Thanks so much, Lucy. So, I mean, we, we've got a minute left. I'm not sure if the talk's going to cut, up, cut out, but um, if you do have any final questions, you can pop them in the chat. Um, if the talk does run out, um, we'll be able to get back with an answer with that by, via your email. I'm um, so happy to take any, any last final questions. Um, I've just seen one asking what the mammal on the kelp bed in the early photo is. I think it is a, a stoat. Yes, I can't remember exactly because I don't have a photo in front of me. But um, yeah, I believe it's a stoat. And we get sort of stoats and otters and all kinds of marine mammals and aquatic mammals that sort of use the marine environment, but are also terrestrial um, using seabed and intertidal habitats. I'm just having a look if there's any other questions we can answer now. Are there any you've seen, Eve? Um, just quickly flicking through them. Um, there was one 
of the golf course um, and is that part of the dune system and that that just sits on the back of the dune systems it might have one day been part of the dune system there and um, but as i said earlier the um, dune system at um, fleetwood is a very thin kind of narrow stretch and um, but imagine it's quite sandy soils over there and um, it, it does have a little owl i believe so there are some owl species that uh, wander about in that area to keep an eye out for <laughs> Um, I've just seen the question asking, um, are the reefs made by honeycomb worms? Yes, um, the worms sort of create those little tubes for them to live in. So each tube will be made by a different worm. Um, and what are the pebbles with holes in we find on the beach? Um, so these are one of my favourite species. Um, these are called boring piddocks. So it's a type of bivalve. So those shells with two halves um, and they have sort of a uh, sort of razor like sawtooth edge on the edge of their shell and they're also able to sort of create hydraulic pressure by drawing water through their shell and squirting it out and they use that to drill into the rock um, and then once they've drilled themselves a hole that's where they can kind of sit and filter feed from there and it's exactly the same principle as with the honeycomb worms they're making themselves a solid little structure that they can sit from so that they're protected from predators they don't wash away that kind of thing thanks just typing away to uh, answer a question on there and um, just a just a message for hannah if you want to contact me directly i've just then um, popped my email address there and um, if you do have any groups locally so i think um can you see any more questions there, Lucy? Um, I can't see any. No. No, I think that's probably all of it. Uh, the question that says, have you checked how old the quahogs are? Um, basically, if you imagine the rings on a tree, um, the bivalves sort of grow seasonally, so they'll grow more in the seasons where they have lots of nutrients and then less in other seasons um so they have sort of fairly accurately aged the quahog based on the rings on its shell i haven't personally checked how old it is but um there were some very meticulous research projects by i think bangor university um to age this quahog they found and it's been verified by a few different people Smashing. Just a question from Sarah there. What, what, where are the best rock pools in Cumbria? Well, as a kid, I used to go to Wormsley Bay on Walney, which used to be a smashing spot. Um, I don't know if Lisa, Lisa can expand on that. Yeah, we've got fantastic rock pools sort of all along the coast. I don't think I could pick one. Um, the ones at North Walney are brilliant. The ones, um, I think, Ernsey Bay is where we went for our kind of Christmas rock pooling extravaganza. And that was, um, yeah a very good place to go smashing well thank you all so much for joining us this evening i hope you enjoyed the talk and um, i really enjoyed listening to lucy as well so thanks so much for joining us tonight lucy and um, if you do have any po any questions and um, feel free to contact us or email us via the website and um, we'll we'll look forward to hearing from you um, to find out about future talks, um, keep an eye out on the Cumbria Wildlife Trust website. Um, not sure if Lucy has any more talks coming up, but I'll be doing one with the um, Solway course AONB soon as well. So you can check out their website too. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you at the uh, next events in future.